My name is Diane Conker, and I'm the director of the UCL School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies. And I have the great privilege to welcome you to this evening's exploration of the controversies uh, and implications surrounding the Novichok poisonings in Salisbury this past year. This is one of a series of ceasing events sponsored by the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, part of our commitment to engage current issues from the disciplinary and interdisciplinary perspectives of our own academic experts and calling upon distinguished commentators from outside UCL. Just want to know how many of you are use of CIS students, students here tonight? Great, so a special welcome to you uh, and a very warm welcome to our guests. And now I'd like to turn the evening over to Dr. Ben Noble, who's a lecturer in Russian politics at UCL CIS. Uh, his research is on the lawmaking process during the legislative stage, policymaking in authoritarian regimes including, of course, Russia. And he's also the convener of the post-Soviet press group, uh, which is a sponsor of tonight's event as well. And he will explain the format and introduce the panelists. Thank you very much, Diane. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, again to this evening's event, Ceasing Salisbury. As Diane said, my name's Ben Noble, and I'm going to be chairing proceedings this evening. The aim of Ceasing Salisbury is to discuss the Novichok poisonings, which shouldn't be a surprise to most of you here. I'm going to give a brief refresher overview of the basic details of those poisonings and their repercussions. But the aim of the, the panel event this evening is to allow the panelists to explore um, the broader dimensions of the poisonings rather than their granular detail. So we'll have uh, um, some panelists talking about the media coverage of the poisonings in the US the UK and Russia. We'll have another panelist looking at similar poisonings in the UK with alleged links to uh, uh, Russia. And then uh, we'll zoom out right at the end to look at the broader context regarding the impact on Russia's place in the world. Are we good? Excellent. Before we get started, uh, there are a few housekeeping points that I need to make. Firstly, the Twitter hashtag for this event is ceasing right up there. Uh, please make sure to get the right number of S's and E's and preferably in the right order. That's a joke that I make far too often, but I keep doing it anyway. Secondly, this event is being live streamed. Uh, that means that you might appear in the footage and any resulting marketing materials in which it's used. If that is of concern to anybody in here, please approach a member of C staff at the end of the event. Finally, please make sure that your electronic devices are in silent mode. So I'm delighted to introduce the four panellists for this evening. Ellen Barry is a Pulitzer Prize winning London based international correspondent for the New York Times covering immigration, security, demographics and culture across Europe. We're particularly pleased that Brexit developments didn't prevent her from joining us this evening. Ellen will talk about her paper's coverage of the poisonings. Dr. Pete Duncan, as many of you know, is Associate Professor in Russian Politics and Society at CIS. Pete's current research is on the relationship between internal changes and foreign policy development in the Russian Federation under the presidencies of Yeltsin, Putin and Medvedev. P uh, Pete will talk this evening about the British context for the poisonings, including previous cases of poisonings with allegations of Russian involvement. Dr. Precious Chatterjee Dudi is a research associate on the project Reforming Russia for the Global Media Sphere from Cold War to Information War at the University of Manchester. She has published research on the politics of national identity, historical narrative, identity construction and representation, Russian foreign and security policy, and global governance. That's quite a lot. Deeply envious. Uh, Precious will talk about the analysis she's done into the appearance of the poisoning suspects on Russian state television. Last but not least, Dr. Aglaya Snitkov is lecturer in the International Politics of Russia at CIS. Her research focuses on critical international relations and security studies, global and regional governance, international security, and Russian foreign policy. Aglaya will talk tonight about the broader implications of the poisonings for Russia's place in international politics. The plan is for each panelist to speak for around 10 to 15 minutes, after which we'll open up the session to questions. Uh, uh, if you would like to ask a question and you're in the room, please raise your hand, uh, and hopefully we'll have time to get to you. If you're following us on the live stream and would like to ask a question via Twitter, please use the hashtag. If you ask a question in this room, a roving mic will get to you if I select you. When you ask a question, please introduce yourself briefly, and please limit yourself to one question. Uh, with minimal commentary, and we should all get on just fine. We've got the room until 9 o'clock, uh, so we should have plenty of time to uh, get to questions uh, after the panellists have made their speeches. 
Before I hand over to Ellen, the first panellist, I'll quickly go through some of the basic details regarding the poisonings in Salisbury. As I said, a basic refresher so we can get to the analysis and analysing the broader context. Um, so this is a chronology, a basic chronology relating to the victims of the poisonings. On March uh, 4th, 2018, Colonel Sergei Skripal, who is a retired Russian military intelligence officer, and his daughter Yulia were found seriously ill on a bench outside the restaurant Zizi in Salisbury City Centre. They were both taken to hospital after that. Subsequently, a policeman who attended Sergei Skripal's home, Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, also fell ill and was hospitalised. On 7th of March, the British police stated that they believed the Skripals and Nick Bailey were poisoned with a nerve agent. Fortunately, all three of those were discharged from hospital between the 22nd of March and the 18th of May. However, on the 30th of June, two further people, Dawn Sturgis and Charlie Rowley, were taken ill in Amesbury after coming into contact with a substance contained in a Nina Ritchie fragrance bottle, which was later confirmed to be Novichok. Dawn Sturgis died on the 8th of July and Charlie Rowley was discharged from hospital on the 20th of July. Now, onto the uh, chronology for the suspects. On the 2nd of March 2018, Dr. Alexander Mishkin, a.k.a. Alexander Petrov, and Col Colonel Anatoly Chepiga, a.k.a. Ruslan Boshirov, entered the UK. What was that intervention from the floor? Mishkin. Ah, Mishkin. What did I say? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You know it's a cease event when you're being corrected on your pronunciation. Great, wonderful. <laughs> the following day, they conducted a reconnaissance mission in Salisbury. On the 4th of March, the two deposited Novichok nerve agent on Sergei Skripal's front door before flying back to Russia. On the 5th of September, so quite a, a while later, the British authorities identified publicly the two as uh, suspects in the poisonings and claimed that they were both officers in Russian military intelligence, so the GU often referred to as the GRU. On the 13th of September, the two men appeared on Russian television in an interview with editor-in-chief of RT, Margarita Simonyan, and we'll hear more about that from Precious. Uh, during that interview, they both denied any involvement in the poisonings, but then on the 26th of September and the 8th of October, after collaborative investigations, Bellingcat and the Insider announced the real identities of Boshirov and Petrov as Chepiga and Mishkin, respectively. Now that the scene is set, I'll hand over to our first panellist, Ellen Barry, to kick us off. Ellen, over to you. Well, I'm very glad to be here tonight. Um, when this story landed in my lap, um, I had never spent any prolonged period writing about Russian intelligence, but I had had occasion to give it some thought because I have lived... I guess, in four stints in the Soviet and Russian space in my life. And um, you become aware of intelligence as part of the machinery of the state, um, as occasionally kind of creaky and noticeable as and inefficient as other parts of the state. Um, and in particular, um, Actually, when, when I was born, my father, who was a Foreign Service officer, was assigned to open the American consulate, the first American consulate in Leningrad, um, and, and we moved there to a city that had been closed to Westerners. Um, and my dad, who's a very funny guy, would always describe how the entire kind of apparatus of the KGB had been assigned to monitor him, and he would often drive around Leningrad with uh, three or four tail cars, um, and he said that he had a very bad sense of direction, and frequently found himself completely lost in the middle of the city and having to turn around in small spaces with three or four tail cars who were required to follow him on those wanderings. Um, the point being that um, my experience of the security apparatus is that it, it, does, it is not always slick, it is not always invisible, and it can be relatively intrusive um, when it wants to when it wants to understand your movements. Um, so in March, uh, having moved here, after leaving Russia, um, I discovered that Russia would be my beat here as well. Um, and not having done a lot of competitive reporting on intelligence, um, I learned pretty quickly that it is a it is a sort of a closed shop, that is. Um, 
outlets that are able to break news on very sensitive intelligence, as in the case of Sergei Skripal, typically are able to do so because of long-standing sourcing relationships with the agencies themselves. Um, the structural problem with that is that the information that comes out about a case like this tends to be what the state, what is in the interest of the state to release. Um, and of course, that is not always what the public needs to know. Um, in this case, I think the central mystery about Sergei Skripal was why he was worth so much trouble on the part of the Russian state. Um, he had been thoroughly debriefed both in Russia and then afterwards in uh, Britain, you know, years and years ago. It was very unlikely that he had new material that he was propagating that would have been, uh, would have put the Soviet system at threat. He was someone who was seen by the British system as not a particular risk. That is why he lived under his own name. It was very easy to find him in a record search. Um, he was living as if, based on everything he had been told, he was safe. Um, so there was this central question we all wanted to answer, which is, what did the British system miss? What did they not see? How did they miss the fact that the Russians may have been interested in killing Sergei Skripal? Um, and that brings you a little bit to the question of duty of care, what is called duty of care, which is um, when the state um, takes on the responsibility, and it's a lifelong responsibility, of taking in a defector uh, or an informant, um, sort of what is the responsibility then of the state to, uh, to protect him. Um, and so we were, we wanted, me and, and Michael Schwartz, who we were working together sort of as a team on this, we set out to try to understand what Sergei Skripal's movements were before he was poisoned, because we knew that he was taking five or six international trips every year. He wasn't just hanging out in Salzburg um, playing <laughs> video games, although that was, that was sort of the impression that came out in the first few days of coverage. This is a person who was thoroughly in retirement. Um, he was living a very private life, and he wouldn't have been of particular interest to the Russian government. Um, so we set out to understand where he had been going and what he had been doing. It is absolutely routine for uh, either defectors or informants to make uh, kind of speaking tours of intelligence agencies um, to talk about their experiences and their knowledge, uh, to share information about their home, their sort of native intelligence agency. Um, and obviously, uh, this is part of what Sergei Skripal was doing. But what we wanted to know was, um, was he perhaps doing something that was more sensitive? Is it possible that he was making contact with his old colleagues in the field? Was he trying to turn people? Was he distributing active leads in any way? Um, and so we spent, I don't know, probably three or four weeks just kind of bird-dogging that story. And we got bits and pieces, mostly um, unattributable, which is the way information sort of passes in this realm. Um, and we managed to prove a few things. We managed to establish that he, um, like Alexander Litvinenko, had been working with Spanish intelligence. And that, of course, is interesting because that was one of the things that had um, immediately preceded Litvinenko's killing, um, is that he was working with Spanish prosecutors. Um, we also found that he had made trips to the Baltic states, um, the sort of Baltic Russian war game, sorry, espionage war games during this period are quite, it's quite, um, intensive, so 
the Baltic states have been able to uncover a fair amount of Russian activity and vice versa. It's just a very kind of live area right now. So he had made trips to the Baltic states in Estonia in particular in 2016. We were able to kind of pin that down for attribution in the newspaper. Um, and we also found that he had gone to the Czech Republic um, and we had a decent amount of contact with the people that he spoke to in the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic has a terrible problem with, uh, with Russian intelligence because they have a gigantic embassy that um, sort of dates back to the 1960s when they established the Russian footprint, the Russian state footprint in the Czech Republic. Um, and, and they simply don't have the resources to track all of the Russian intelligence officers that are in the Czech Republic. As a result, someone like Sergei Skripal um, was potentially very useful in identifying uh, operatives there. Um, and although what we were told and what we published in, in the newspaper is that he didn't give them particular names, um, he did explain the kind of um, the structure of Russian team building and some of the forms of, uh, of undercover work. And the year after he visited Prague, there were five, I think five, Russian uh, intelligence officers working under diplomatic cover who were um, expelled from the Czech Republic. So, so we were kind of interested in knowing how um, how relevant that work may have been in the sequence of events that led to the attack on him. Um, I don't think we uh, came to a definitive answer to that question, by the way, um, and I think there's an enormous amount that we didn't know about. It, is certainly, it certainly has been the Russian, uh, sorry, the, the, the British interpretation that, um, that Sergei Skripal was more of a demonstrative victim than a particular victim. That is, um, the attack on him was meant to send a message, a generalized message, or was part of a standing order um, that may have applied to a number of different people, that there was nothing particular about Sergei Skripal. Um, and when Michael and I finally wrote our, our longest piece on this, we called him a little fish, um, sort of reflecting that theory that he was chosen specifically because um, he was representative of something, not because he was uh, a sort of particular enemy of the Russian state. I think we're far from knowing for sure whether this is the answer, but this is uh, sort of what the information that's come out has sort of led us to. Um, a couple interesting things happened in the media, I would say, during the coverage. Not in the media, but in the relationship between the British state and the media um, during the coverage. And, and one of them is that I think that um, the British system began to reassess its habit of um, of relative secrecy regarding sensitive investigations. Um, this is a very disciplined system and um, compared to the United States where there is a real clamor for transparency, I think there is, it, it felt to me as an American, much less of a demand um, for information about the investigation than I would have expected in my own country. Um, but I think it was observable to the British authorities over time that this allowed, um, this allowed Russia to take over the narrative on some level. So initially in the first few days, perhaps the first two weeks after Sergei Skripal's poisoning, um, obviously, Theresa May was able to um, gather a really quite impressive uh, team of European and world powers who were ready to stand with Britain on this case. In the months that followed that, there was very little that came out about the investigation. And um, an enormous amount 
that was coming out to undermine the British case. And it wasn't all coming out of Russian sources. Often it, you didn't even know where it came from. But um, in June, I did a story from Salisbury, which was just interviewing people I met on the street or I met in bars. And what I discovered is that there were quite a lot of people who took the Russian side of the argument. Um, that some of them were young people um, who were reading material on social media. Some of them were cab drivers who were talking to each other. And occasionally, there were people who were getting information from RT or from relatives in Bulgaria or Romania. Um, but the point is that the counter narrative had really gotten out there very thoroughly um, by the summer. And I think it, that is a, a matter of concern for British authorities. Um, and I think in some ways it has pushed them in the direction of more transparency. Um, I mean, we'll have to see as time goes on whether, whether, whether there's evidence of that. But I, I feel like I've seen that process happen in the last few months. Um, and then the second really significant thing, which I'm sure some of us will be talking about later, is that you had information coming out of non-state intelligence um, operations like Bellingcat and The Insider. Um, these are mostly open source uh, intelligence gathering operations, but it has been really fascinating to see that states may be losing their monopoly on um, on intelligence gathering. So in this case, what we have learned, you know, a little bit late in the game in this investigation is that there was an enormous amount that was available through databases that are for sale in Russia, um, which by the way, in you know, much of the world databases are for sale, um, but Russia, you know, particularly. Um, an enormous amount was simply available online in the form of legal records. Um, you know, Bellingcat has really just come out with um, several waves of really um, damaging material that I'm sure has made uh, the, the Russian intelligence organs um, quite chagrined. I, um, I think that that catching up to open source material is going to be a process that takes them years and years. Um, and I think the reports that we've seen coming out of Bellingcat and Insider, um, it's the beginning of something, it's not the end of something. And, um, and for, I, I think for the intelligence services of all of our countries, they are going to find themselves um, suddenly coping with um, a diminished ability to keep secrets, um, which as a journalist I think is a, is a, is a good thing uh, as a general matter, but, um, but I think it would be a big worry if I ran the GRU. <laughs> um, so that's all for now, but I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you, um, Ellen. I must say that, uh, do I need this? Do I need this machine? I, I do. Oh, sorry, over the thing, right, sorry. Can, can you, yes, you can, yeah. Um, Ellen, I, I must say I'm, I'm grateful that you had time to talk about the specifics of uh, what Segre Skripal was doing. Um, and uh, that, that is, uh, that certainly uh, goes a good, a long way, I think, to the explanation. Um, it's, there's more to it, I want to add to that now. Um, here I must confess to self-plagiarism which you can't do in CC if you're a student, but I can do it. Um, to, because uh, uh, we had a ceasing Putin event in March that some of you, yes, some of you were at. Um, and uh, and that, this was one of the series that uh, Ben has been so efficient and creative at organizing and getting really good people, so I'm not excluding myself, getting really good people to come and speak. Um, and, um, uh, and what I arg argued there was that the timing of the murder, uh, attempted murder, the poisoning, sorry, of uh, the Skripals, uh, was to do with the election campaign. Everything that you said about his intelligence work, I agree with, but the timing. First of March, um, the Putin uh, gave his address to the Federal Assembly. 
this was a context where the elections were coming up within three weeks, and the Kremlin decided that they wanted to get a, a significant turnout. They wanted people to actually come out and vote. Um, otherwise, uh, because there was no real competition, because the competition had been either locked up or, sh or shot, uh, in the case of Nemtsov, um, they, there was, uh, th th in order to try and give some reality to the elections, there had to be some kind of, something to make people turn out and vote positively for Putin. And so this addressed the Federal Assembly, which normally takes place inside the Federal Assembly buildings of the Kremlin. Uh, instead, this was in the Manege, and it was a, a videos were shown, and the videos showed uh, supposedly weapons that Russia had just got. In fact, some were seven years old, but pretend they were just got these weapons that could destroy enemies anywhere in the world. And then just three days later, 4th of March, uh, anywhere in the world includes Salisbury. And uh, as Yvonne Q, uh, the Russian television, uh, straight away showed pictures of Salisbury, uh, showed the police, the, uh, the, what was going on around the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the people, the Skripals. And um, the context of this is, um, uh, the one that I'd add to what uh, Ellen had said, is going back to 2010, when at the time that Skripal, Sergei Skripal was exchanged, well, a group of, um, uh, of four Russians who were exchanged for uh, 10 um, FSB agents or SVR agents who'd been working in America, um, including the famous Anna Chapman. The, uh, he said at the time of the exchange, traitors must kick the bucket. In other words, he was warning um, these people, don't think just because you're in Britain or America you're going to be safe. And he was, uh, even, even in his capacity at that point, he was prime minister, um, he knew that he could back up that, uh, that threat with force. And knowing all this, I, I said in, the, in March that I thought that Theresa May was absolutely right. Now, most of the time, I never agree with Theresa May. Anything that Theresa May does is almost, almost on principle wrong. Um, but um, on this, she was right. And, the, and she was well advised, I have to say, by, by British intelligence. Um, and she said to the, the Russian ambassador, come along and um, uh, answer these questions. Was it, did, was it done by the Russian state, or what, did this Novichok poison, which could only have come from, ultimately from the Russian state, did it fall into bad hands? You've lost control of your poisons. And so what's the response of the Russian side after this? That very day that the Russian ambassador was supposed to give a response, in fact didn't, well, another body was found. Nikolai Glushkov was found uh, in London. Glushkov, I'm not sure whether you remember this, Ellen, but he'd worked with Berezovsky. Uh, to be exact, he'd stolen money together with Berezovsky from the Russian people, ordinary Russians in the 1990s. He was somebody who was hated by ordinary Russians. And uh, on the tele again on television, um, the, and he'd taken asylum effectively in Britain, um, but on television, Russian television, uh, again, pictures of Glushkov, this time when he was on trial. So the message to ordinary Russian people was, we can get your enemies. We, that we have a powerful state uh, machine, um, so uh, you should turn out to vote for Putin because you should be proud of everything that he's done to build up the Russian state. And the secondary message is, to anyone who's a dissident, anyone who, is thinking, who perhaps is not in working intelligence and is thinking about defecting, think again, be very afraid, because we can get you. And of course, um, the Russia officially, Putin, uh, is spokespersons, the foreign ministry, always deny any sort of Russian involvement. But it's important to understand that these denials are not those sort of denials that are intended to be believed. It's uh, the, the denials that people in Russia can understand, um, and people in the West also, in, in practice, at least at policy-making levels, understand that. Uh, the, the classic parallel is um, when Putin was saying about uh, the Donbass uh, in 2014, there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. Everyone knew, everyone in Russia, everyone in the West knew there were Russian troops in Ukraine. You weren't supposed to believe it. Um, you were supposed to get the message, Russia, Russia is very powerful. But from a diplomatic point of view, by doing, going into the denial, then um, Putin's protecting himself and um, uh, can't be called to account if, as, as if he had admitted it. And so having made these points uh, um, in the course of the election campaign, I felt justified when at the end of the election campaign, after the votes were in, 
um, one of Kirien Kirienka's um, uh, people who'd actually been running the technicalities of the campaign said uh, officially in public um, in talking about how the turnout was, as he saw it, was good. Uh, maybe Salisbury helped, which was a way of him saying, as, uh, as the people who were running the election campaign, who decided this was the time to instruct the, uh, the GU to carry out uh, the assassination, this is the time that we want it done, and see uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin how successful we have been in carrying out, in making sure that um, uh, you've been reelected with a big uh, turnout. But coming back to um, our, Ellen's other point, I, again I agree that the Britain has totally f um, not uh, um, fulfilled the duty of care that it owed to Sergei Skripal. In fact, he was living under his own name. He was openly living as Sergei Skripal, and it wasn't difficult for anyone who visited Salisbury, as some people did apparently, to see that he was still in regular contact with British intelligence. Somebody came up from London every week, apparently. Um, but uh, so uh, overall, the, um, the poisonings of the Skripals represent a policy failing for Britain. And this case has been argued uh, strongly and very well by Duncan Allen um, in a recent Chatham House paper on the Skripals. And he goes right back to the poisoning of um, Alexander Litvinenko in 2006. Um, again, the British government very quickly, after investigations, uh, there, were, there were investigations, um, but after, fairly quickly came to the conclusion that, this, that uh, the FSB, and people associated with the FSB were responsible. And the Labour government demanded the extradition from Russia of two named individuals. And the, uh, in, the, in the course of 2007, the following year, and relations were not good, and they went even worse with, with the Russian-Georgian war, um, which uh, uh, Britain practically, um, well, the, the, the NATO-Russia Council ceased to function for a while after that. And Britain broke off um, the security cooperation with um, the FSB after the Litvinenko murder. In 2010, only five minutes, gosh. Um, in 2010, the, uh, uh, the coalition came to power, the Conservatives, uh, Liberal Democrats. Theresa May, as Home Secretary. Um, by then, Marina Litvinenko, Alexander Litvinenko's widow, had been gathering support uh, nationally and, and internationally, actually, for a proper inquiry into what had happened. It wasn't enough to say, just to, for Putin to say, we don't extradite Russian citizens, so of course we're not going to send, send them away. Um, um, but uh, she, there was a, quite a considerable demand in Britain for a public inquiry under the impetus of Marina Litvinenko's uh, efforts. And Theresa May's Home Secretary, a position she held for six years, um, refused to hold an inquiry citing national security grounds. This won't make public what clear what it was. Did it mean that Russia was, Britain was frightened that Russia would attack us if we set up a public inquiry? Did it mean that it would affect the economic security of the city of London because the Russian money would be withdrawn? It wasn't at all clear. But in 2014, after the in, in, uh, invasion, uh, the accession of Crimea, invasion of uh, eastern Ukraine, uh, and the, uh, there was no... Uh, the, the obstacles to um, upsetting Russia were more or less removed as Britain went uh, into the sanctions mode, beginning to put sanctions uh, against Russia, um, particularly economic sanctions in particular sectors. Um, then uh, the British government changed its line and Theresa May uh, allowed an inquiry to be held, which after a couple of years... Um, found out that, reported that the FSB was behind the uh, murder of Litvinenko and that Putin probably knew about it. That's actually 10 years, 2016, um, 10 years after he'd actually been murdered. That's how long things take in Britain. Um, but meanwhile, there have been um, uh, 14 other deaths uh, reported by BuzzFeed in a, in a major report last year, connected with Russia and Georgia, that... Um, uh, Britain had failed to negotiate to uh, investigate or said that they weren't even suspicious. And even when somebody's Pyrrhopolichny, for example, 
uh, when he was found with poison inside him just before he was about to testify against Russian organized crime, the, the Surrey police said that, no, it's natural causes. Um, there was a clear bias on the part of the British state not to investigate crimes involving Russians. I can't go into the details because of time reasons. I've got them here if people would like to ask me. Um, but after the uh, Salisbury events, um, the, the major response was the diplomatic, expelling the diplomats and getting NATO to uh, respond. But while there was a lot of talk about economic sanctions and visa sanctions, in fact, this was the rhetoric rather than what actually happened. There was a major uh, impact when Abramovich had a delay in getting his visa. And we know uh, from Moscow that, that people began to be worried when they heard that. The talk went in Moscow, don't go to Britain. It's, it might be dangerous economically, and not just economically, but physically, and in terms of investigation, to go to Britain at the moment. So that had some sort of effect. But generally speaking, the rhetoric of the government has been very different from the action, because um, the, the city of London still um, is very grateful to have these, um, the, the Russian money coming in. It's benefited from be acting as a center for money laundering. Russians like to uh, use London as a place for property investment, place to uh, leave their mistresses or their wives, to send their children to, um, uh, to, to schools, to universities. Uh, it's convenient because people leave, speak English, and that's their, their first language. And, the, uh, and Britain, as the, uh, as the metropolitan country of the British Overseas Territories, um, St. Kitts, Nevis, uh, Belize, the Man, and so on, British Virgin Islands, uh, the direct connections from the city of London to there are very convenient for Russian organized crime, which, of course, is very closely linked with the Russian state to operate from. And so despite all the rhetoric about increasing the sanctions, in practice, Russian companies, just in the last week, uh, EN Plus and VTB have made, uh, been allowed to raise money on the stock exchange. It's very similar to what's happening in Saudi Arabia. On the one hand, shock um, that the, uh, they murdered um, a Turkish person in the Saudi consulate in, uh, in Istanbul. On the other hand, well, we need to sell them arms. There's a lot of money at stake. And that's the, that's the British <laughs> attitude. The attitude of the British government, the attitude of the city of London. Um, and so the only tool that's been seriously talked about is the un unexplained wealth orders, and I've got one minute, is it? One minute, yes. So, um, and the, and the, although the fuss was made about unexplained wealth orders, which is a way of calling to account somebody, some criminal, whether it's Russian or Arab or whatever, uh, has got money, they have to explain more than 50,000 pounds, where did you get it? Otherwise it can be forfeited. That's only been one case which has been investigated, Hajiva, and there's possibly another case coming up with Ablyazov. And the point is that these people are actually being investigated are people who have already fallen out of favor of the regimes where they come from. So Hajiva's husband is actually in prison as Azerbaijan, and Ablyazov's wanted in Kazakhstan. So, what, so the British government is still being quite hypocritical um, about saying, on the one hand, we want to, to um, clamp down on Russian crime uh, we want to stop Britain being a place where Russian uh, agencies can freely operate and kill people. Um, but on the other hand, they're still allowing Russian crime to flourish because it's the interest of, of the government. And I have to say of those organizations that donate to the Conservative Party. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Precious Chatterjee Doody, and as Ben mentioned, I'm working on a large project at the moment looking into RT, the international broadcaster formerly known as Russia Today. It's not in fact called reforming Russia, but reframing Russia, which is a slightly different prospect, I think you'll find. Um, so it's a large project. It involves six researchers at the University of Manchester, where I'm based, and the Open University. And some of the work I'm kind of talking to you about today owes a, a, a big credit to my colleagues, Rhys Crilly and Vera Tolt. So I should mention that straight away. Um, the entire project is dealing with the complete range of outputs of RT and also audience uh, impacts of the network, too. 
Um, and the Skripal case is just kind of one thing we're looking at, and we've archived basically lots of our other work on our website, reframingrussia.com, so you can have a look there if you're interested. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, so RT is an international broadcaster funded from the Russian state budget. It was established in 2005 um, with a couple of main objectives to represent Russia to the West and also to present a Russian perspective on international events because there was this idea that there's a current dominance of Western media outlets which get to set news agendas and frame how those news stories are reported. And RT was seen as a sort of... Um, seen as something able to counteract that. And it's become more and more controversial uh, recently as relations between Russia and countries in North America and Western Europe have deteriorated. Uh, and perhaps the most well-known example of this would be when several of its uh, reporting staff either resigned or protested on air over its um, misleading coverage of the Crimean annexation. So that's a good example of uh, RT's coverage of Russian foreign policy being particularly unreliable. Although, on the other hand, in areas not related to Russian foreign policy, and the picture's a bit different, it's won various awards for its investigative reporting and special online projects, so it's quite a mixed picture with the network. Now, concerns about RT have um, risen, basically, uh, in relation to these ongoing controversies, and we've seen this in political responses, so we've had lots of uh, security and intelligence community reports looking at what kind of dangers RT might pose in Western societies. Uh, political parties in the UK have advised their representatives not to appear on the network. Uh, and recently, uh, following the Skripal poisonings, uh, it was discussed in the House of Parliament whether or not to ban the network. Um, and within this context, Ofcom, the British uh, TV regulator, has announced seven investigations into RT's coverage of precisely these poisonings. Um, and it's ongoing at the moment, but the aim is to see whether RT um, fulfills the requirements to be a fit and proper broadcaster. And depending on what that, in, those investigations find, um, RT could have to broadcast a summary of Ofcom's findings or could even have its license to broadcast in the UK revoked. And that's quite important context for what I'm going to talk to you about in, in a moment. So if we look at how RT was covering the Skripal coverage, um, from the very start, its, its reporting was completely intertwined with the network's own brand identity. And this culminated in the exclusive interview uh, that Ben mentioned earlier, conducted by RT's editor-in-chief with the two suspects in the case. Um, now, it's important to note right at the start that RT's coverage overall was much more measured than Russian domestic TV, where it was very much alleged outright that actually British security services were responsible for this. RT, and remember the context of the Ofcom investigation, has been much more measured, much more careful in how it reports on the case. So initially, um, reporting of the case was not about the poisoning at all. In fact, RT, in the, in the days following the poisoning, it reported on the wave of media hysteria in the UK and Russophobia in the UK press, which kind of relates to what Ellen was saying earlier about um, sources uh, needing long-standing relationships with sources to be able to break actual news. RT obviously didn't have those, so went with a slightly different angle on the story. And it built up its coverage really about questioning official accounts in the British media or from the British government, um, putting a kind of Russian perspective on that, um, but nonetheless giving prominent coverage to official accounts on both sides. So it wasn't just uh, one-sided information, it was kind of factually accurate, but told from a Russian perspective, and particular repeat guests were often used, including the Russian ambassador to the UK, who's come up already today, who was not only used as an official source, but was interviewed, appeared on talk shows, has an op-ed column on RT. So he's getting to provide all the, the kind of packaging to the telling of the tale. And so we saw, as this was reported, uh, inconsistencies in official accounts really being highlighted by RT, and the use of sarcasm and satire to make inferences about what those gaps in the narrative might mean. Again, not alleging anything quite directly, but raising eyebrows and letting the audience do that work. Um, and there were huge charges of Russophobia all the time linked to criticisms of Western media, uh, Western governments, Western institutions. And yet we saw differences in RT's output uh, according to how that was presented. So there were some more talented journalists give a much more kind of balanced, in-depth uh, account, whereas others really 
approached conspiracy theory, I would say. Um, now, as the story developed, the coverage changed in response to that, and we got particular narratives coming through. So when Yulia Skripal released her video statement, RT strongly intimated that this was made under duress and that the UK was violating diplomatic protocol by not allowing Russian consular access to the Skripals. But importantly, that was not the core editorial line. It was delegated to the mouths of experts whose quotes insinuating those things were woven together and they were actually reported those quotes so it wasn't coming from RT particularly and then I'll just point you back to the context being the ongoing Ofcom investigation um, and then similarly when the suspects were charged um, under their aliases initially this resulted in absolutely saturated coverage RT went mad and all of the coverage was related to Russophobia um, no real evidence has been produced and yet and so that was the whole tone of the coverage at that point and overall, the research that we've been doing suggests that these representations, they largely resonated with Artie's audiences. So we analysed a lot of Artie's videos um, on YouTube. It has a playlist dedicated to the Skripal case of six, uh, 60 videos, which had over one and a half million views when we looked at it. Um, and there were 32,000 upvotes on that body of videos compared to only 4,200 downvotes, which gives you a very crude measure that, in general, people watching approved of the sentiments within them. Um, so then we went on to analyze the actual content and the actual responses to some of these videos. We looked at news coverage and we looked at extended programming where there's more of an opportunity to articulate a sort of analytical line in the program or to express an opinion in the program to see if they differed. And in the news coverage, uh, the audience comments that we analyzed were absolutely overwhelmingly critical of the UK over a quarter were pointing out inconsistencies in the British narrative, and over a third were articulating conspiracy theories. So basically, we saw the precise framing of RT's coverage reflected in how viewers commented about what was being reported. And then when we looked at the extended programming, there were some even more interesting findings. So it was still highly critical of the UK and its allies. There was a similar proportion that noticed, uh, noted inconsistencies in the British narrative but there were 73% of the comments we analyzed were um, overtly conspiratorial. So an example of this was someone saying, it's more likely that the CIA poisoned them than Russia. And so again, the audience responses really clearly reflected the framing of, of that content where conspiracy theories had been much more clearly articulated. And so we concluded that RT viewers were basically skeptical of the British version of events. They thought alternative explanations were plausible and they were quite open to conspiracy theory. But when RT in, uh, aired its interview with the suspects, this completely changed the picture. So just to kind of recap, ostensibly this was a genuine exclusive whereby the two suspects had called RT's editor-in-chief uh, of their own volition to tell their side of the story because she posted something on social media. Um, and we'll just leave aside that this came a day after Putin personally uh, intervened, <laughs> suggesting that these private citizens might want to make themselves known. Uh, and their story was they were just two nutritional supplement salesmen, <laughs> just good friends in the UK as tourists to see the world-famous Salisbury, Salisbury Cathedral, not to mention its 123-meter spire, and they struggled with the inclement weather. So I think we're all kind of aware of that story, and for obvious reasons, uh, the social media response was pretty scathing. So... Uh, Basically, social media responses encroached on RT's usual territory. So RT often uses sarcasm and satire to fill gaps in real reporting. And we saw social media kind of reflecting that back onto RT. So Twitter was awash with jokes about Russians and snow, um, puns on spy film titles, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spire, or um, <laughs> From Russia with Novichok. Um, and so this was precisely the kind of apolitical political commentary that RT deals with in its stock in trade. And so audience reactions were not just incredulous about what the men were saying about uh, the case, but also about why they were on RT at all. And this is important. So uh, 
the audiences who viewed this video were overwhelmingly critical of the suspect's claims. For many of them, it actually changed their opinions of the whole case. So one good example, not a very convincing interview at all. I wasn't doubting the Russian government until I saw this video. <laughs> Um, and the airing of the video also reflected badly on RT. So there were numerous people saying that um, RT was fake news. By airing this, it had proven itself to be fake news. And RT really struggled to manage this poor reception of the video. So in the days immediately afterwards, its, its coverage was basically 50-50 with satirical reporting that suggested, you know, we don't believe them either. We're on on the Joe. And then 50% were, were kind of you know, they have some serious points that throw into doubt the UK narrative. And so there was this massive kind of split in RT's coverage. Um, they reported negative reactions from UK politicians and UK press, but not of the negative response from the general public, which was quite interesting. Um, and the speculation that actually the whole thing was done for the purpose of domestic audiences. And yet, when we looked at Artie's Russian version of this interview video, they were also really skeptical about the content. Um, and Simon Yan, who conducted the interview, she really performed incredulity throughout the video. She was showing that maybe she didn't believe what these guys were saying. Um, Russian-speaking audiences got that incredulity. International audiences didn't at all. And so following the interview, she, she tried to ram that point home in various press conferences. She, she strongly intimated that it's up for, it's for audiences to, to decide. I never said whether I believed them and, and really kind of tried to push that point. Now then when the, the results of the Bellingcat and Insider investigation came out, again, RT really struggled. Its coverage was completely low key, basically not covered at all. Uh, and what it did talk about was trying to discredit Bellingcat on account of its methods it uses, where its funding come from, comes from, does it have links to NATO, how has it come to um, become so prominent in recent years, is it a front for secret services, and they completely ignored the insider, which actually did pretty much all of the journalistic legwork, and which it would have been much harder to discredit. So, to conclude, because I've already had my five minute warning, um, RT generally places itself as a digitally savvy and experimental network which is at ease with social media and capable of telling uncomfortable truths in a media environment that's dominated by Western media outlets. And initially, its, it's representation of the Skripal case really did resonate with its audiences. And perhaps that's because they were predisposed to a mistrust of Western institutions and state apparatuses. But all this changed following RT's broadcast of the interview with the suspect. Uh, the staging was all wrong. It came directly after Putin's intervention. It was on a Russian state-funded network. Uh, Simon Yan's performance of incredulity was totally lost on international audiences, despite then trying to emphasize that after the fact. Um, and Arty has really struggled to deal with the ramifications of that. So this poor reception of the suspect's interview and the resultant fallout really shows the fragility of Arty's position and casts doubt on its ability to work as a soft power instrument of the Russian state, particularly given its failure to judge online audiences in this very crucial uh, instance. And as Pete dropped a bomb at the end of his uh, little talk, I think I will too. I'll leave you with the words of one of the commenters on, uh, on the Russian language version of the interview, who said, by posting this video and also not disabling comments, you've totally screwed yourselves. <laughs> So I got, in my brief, I got given the brief of trying to put the Salisbury's attacks into a broader context in terms of Russian foreign policy and also Russia's relations with the West. Um, obviously a lot has been written about it and in thinking about sort of what is it I think uh, about this case and what does it actually say about the, the wider ramifications, um, I came up with the notion of that essentially what we've been going through since, I guess, Putin has come to power is a form of an age of meddling. Um, and so in this talk, what I'm interested in looking at is the way in which this idea of meddling has actually evolved since the 2000s in, I would say, quite substantial ways. So 
in particular, I think when it comes to Russia and the West, and this is sort of how I've divided the talk, is I think initially we have much more of a conversation about the West meddling in Russia in the 2000s. And it has since changed in the 2010s to much more of a discussion about Russia meddling in the West. And I think that's quite an interesting dynamic that one must keep in mind whenever we're talking about uh, what is going, currently going on. And I think some of the, the, the key themes that we have to keep in mind is not only what does it mean to meddle, um, but also change in threat perceptions, particularly when it comes to different actors' capability and intent in meddling. But also, I think, the extent to which one is able to meddle in one set of affairs, namely in politics slash security, and not meddle or not connect to other dynamics um, in terms of Russia and the West, namely economics. And this is something that um, Pete has already alluded to. So by way of a context and an introduction, um, I think that a lot of this discussion, particularly around the idea of whether we're living through a new Cold War, can be taken back to the Cold War. Uh, very briefly, I think the end of the Cold War, to some extent, was supposed to signal the end of meddling between Russia and the West. For right or wrong reasons, in the 1990s, there was kind of an assumption that basically that era is gone, finished, forgotten, and that was not the way we run things anymore. Arguably, it's because Russia was no longer seen as important in the West, and arguably also because relations between the Russia and the West, um, if not positive, but did increasingly come to intermesh much more so than previously. And this did, however, change in the 2000s. But this is where we have to go back to when we're thinking about meddling, because it's with Putin coming to power and the creation of this narrative of the West meddling in Russia that um, we need to situate the, the whole discussion about Salisbury. In the 2000s, the West meddling in Russia was in part driven by the fact that the Putin regime was trying to posi position its own order within the country, uh, both in political, economic, social, media terms, and in either for reasons of convenience or more broadly, saw the West um, connections with internal actors within Russia as an inconvenience. Now, whether or not the West had an intent or the capability to meddle in Russia is something that I will leave um, perhaps for Q&A. Uh, but nonetheless, there was an assumption that the West has allied itself with certain groups within the domestic Russian realm and was seeking to, if not overthrow, but at least make the political order difficult. Indeed, again, whether one agrees with that analysis or not um, is something for debate. From the West perspective, um, this form of Russia's assumed meddling that it was conducting in the 2000s was laughed at. It was seen as a joke that was basically made up by the regime and not to be taken seriously. At the same time, it was also assumed that the threat coming from Russia in the 2000s was actually quite limited. Um, Russia was perceived as a power on the way down, and it was basically seen as not having the capability of meddling in the West. And I would argue that from the West point of view in the 2000s, it was also assumed that the Russia has no um, intent to meddle in the West domestic affairs and no interest. And this, I think, when Pete talks about sort of the discussion about Litvinenko and a 2006 um, case of poisoning, I think this is where you have to position it within the context. So I think at the time, from the West point of view, they just didn't take Russia's meddling particularly seriously. They did kind of assume that it was a one-off event. I think what's important is that in the 2000s, there was still very much a separation between politics and economics. And what I mean by that is both from the Russian point of view and the West point of view, you could, you could insulate economics and relations economically could continue to grow between the two sides, whilst at the same time this meddling could, uh, or criticism of meddling could, on, could develop from a political point of view. There was also an element whereby in the 2000s an assumption was that despite such forms of meddling, relations could basically be um, relaunched, restarted, rejigged, and every time there was a new American president, we were waiting for a new kind of warming of relations between Russia and the West. But I would say that in the 2010s, however, we have a complete change of pace and a change of dynamics. Um, 
Critically, there's a perceptual change. So I would say that Russia went, went from being seen as a loud, loud dissenter in international affairs to a threatening meddler and arguably everyone's favorite villain. Um, this change of attitude, I think, from the point of view of the West, did come as a result of Georgia, Ukraine, uh, UNSC stalemate over Syria, US elections, etc. <coughs> from the Russian point of view, I think there was also hardening of positions and this perceived meddling from the West, um, the Russians essentially chose to go on the offensive. And um, there is increasingly now an assumption that Russia's bark is no longer, so there was an assumption that Russia's bark was always worse than its bite, and I argue that it has now, this, this perception has now been changed. And there is now an argument and a suggestion that Russians both have the capability and the intent to meddle within the West domestic sphere. Now objectively you could look at, I don't know, Russia's expenditure in terms of defense law and order, being it the third of its federal budget. Uh, you can look at, um, its use of hybrid warfare when it comes to Ukraine, potentially in the Baltic states, US elections, um, linking up with right wing, both right wing and left wing political groups within um, Europe. But I think what is important is that um, after Ukraine, for example, there's been a very much an interest in focusing on Russia's um, in Russia's influence in Western domestic space around the idea of hybrid warfare. But I think actually that's a term that lots of people have argued has been misused, but I think it's also um, wrong insofar as it actually still assumes that there is much more intent and much more of an organized operation, perhaps done in different ways, be it in terms of social media, in terms of cyber activities, in terms of operatives, or in terms of large-scale exercises. But there is this sort of very much this idea of a Gerasimov doctrine. I would think that actually positioning Russia's influence um, in, the domestic, in the West domestic realm is much better seen through the prison of meddling, because I think it is much less organized and much more ad hoc. In that context, there's been very much a conversation as to whether or not the West can do anything to counteract this influence. And I think within this context, the notion of meddling is important because we are living in a period where on the one hand, there is probably a need for a counter sort of operation and a way of having an, a more pan-European, pan, -European, pan sort of transatlantic response, but at the same time, as demonstrated by Salisbury, it's important to keep in mind that this form of meddling can be both unpredictable and very context dependent. So at the moment, in terms of the counteracting um, measures that the West has taken has obviously been uh, NATO's presence, increased presence next to Russia's border, sanctions, cyber capabilities, and also um, severe, substantial attempts at um, at counteracting Russia's disinformation campaigns. And this is very much being done both on the government level, at the EU level, but also more from sort of civil society. Now, important to take into account the Russia's point of view in this, namely that, um, as Karaganov wrote in Russian Global Affairs, people in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones, which I think very much comes back to the fact that the, actually the West is seen as the original cause of Russia's meddling, and therefore Russia has nothing kind of to feel guilty about, i.e. also that they didn't start it first. I think also something to take into account is that both in Russia and the West, we actually now have recognition that the time of resets is gone. And I think arguably that is one of the saddest things about the current period we're living through, namely that both in the West and in Russia is an assumption that relations will be bad for the next few decades. This is not something that can be reset in two years, three years. People are now talking about 20 years. And that is actually quite a long time. At the same time, the Russians are going both inwards and outwards in response to bad relations with the West. So they're shoring up domestic econ economics at the same time as obviously opening up to the East and also going, for example, to Middle East, as demonstrated by the fact that um, the Russians are not against um, summits in Saudi Arabia. <coughs> 
At the same time, I think there is also a realization that from both sides that politics and economics can no longer be, be um, kept separated and that both parties will take a hit economically. Now, it is still see, to be seen the extent to which the Brits are willing to take an economic hit over Skripal, and I think that is something we should be watching, as everyone has mentioned. But in Russia's case, increased sanctions are foreseen and they will be survivable. And the regime is prepared and is gearing up their people for living through it. In the West, I would argue that there is also, um, I guess, a recognition to what extent in practice this will happen in London. We are yet to see that an economic hit must be taken. Now, the West is not unified in this response. The, US, the Americans are much happier to put sanctions because they take the lesser economic hit. The Brits, we shall yet to see. However, they have been, you know, they have had a chemical and biological attack on their soil and therefore surely must respond uh, and must take an economic hit. But it is interesting that from the EU's point of view, for example, of course, it is now the, uh, West soft underbelly, uh, and they may perhaps uh, shake in their sanction regimes. Now, by way of sort of summing up and saying something about the Skripal itself, I think that we're looking at the evolution in, for example, the response from Litvinenko in 2006 to Skripal in 2018. I think you, you indeed see this change of dynamic, not only in the perception of the threat coming from Russia, but also in an attempt to really consider what is it the West can do about it. Now, I think the difficulty is that because Russia doesn't have a doctrine and a well cut out sort of strategy that you can pinpoint to and counterattack, meddling is much more difficult because it is much more unpredictable. It is much more ad hoc. Um, and to some extent, whilst I do agree that Duncan Allen, with Duncan Allen and with, with Pete that uh, the Brits failed in giving an adequate response after Litvinenko and uh, went for what Duncan <coughs> Allen talks about, deterrence by denial rather than deterrence by punishment. At the same time, such attacks are quite difficult to predict and counterattack. The difficulty also stems from the fact that this is only just a one-off. And there are many other different, more nuanced ways in which Russia can meddle in the West. And I think it is also something that is important for the Europeans and the Americans to consider the extent to which both the nature of this threat and also how it is that we can respond. Now, from the Russian point of view, the meddling in the West did coincide with a much more tightening of a grip across many sectors of Russian society. This is not the, something that the West is willing to do because this is not the way we run things. But at the same time, there is much more of a question as to how is it that we run things when the global is coming home? And whilst at the same time, at the moment, you can argue that Russia is everyone's favorite villain, it is not that many of the problems that have been highlighted by Russia's meddling are isolated to the Russia case. And there are much more of a broad spectrum of issues that we do have to consider. Great. On this point, I will finish. Thank you all very much. Now we'll move on to questions. Those of you who want to leave right now, please do so, so we can cause minimal disruption. Excellent. Not many people want to leave. That's always a good sign. We'll take questions in three. I'll start with questions in the room, followed by three from Twitter. So the first question here, please. Oh. Right Set to Anastasia. Should I start? Yes. So um, my name is Anastasia. I'm a postgraduate student at CIS. I have a question for Aglaya. You were saying that there is an evolution of British response from Litvinenko to uh, Skripal. But do you think that is not a real revolu evolution, but rather um, the fact that a British citizen died in the Skripal case as a result of the attack matters in this case? Second question over here. 
is it was a different because Krupal was a British. Thank you very much, Michael Pugh, Pugh, lecturer Pugh, in law and exactly. all time Russianist. Um, I just wanted to check. I'm conscious there have been assassinations in other countries in Europe over many decades. Um, Stepan Bandera, for example, notably in Munich in the 1960s. But do you think there's any significance in the fact that these prominent murders have happened in Britain rather than, say, Germany? Um, I was wondering at, at what point, sorry, I'm um, Ollie Spray. Um, I was wondering at what point do you think that um, public support for this sort of meddling uh, will run out in Russia and whether there is public support for this sort of meddling um, with, the, with the implementation of um, sanctions, uh, economic sanctions in Russia? Um, I don't know who you think would be best to answer that. So in terms of the, um, whether the revolution is, I mean, both were British citizens, uh, um, Litvinenko and Skribal, were they? Yes, they were. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, but they're still citizens, that's the point. Well, yeah, the, so, no, I mean, I would say that the response from Theresa May came immediately after Skripal, and that was the change. It was a change of pace, um, and there was much more of an argument of, look, you cannot use chemical and biological weapons on our soil. And I think that's what um, hit it, more than the fact that a British-born citizen died, um, partly because there was an expectation that Skripal would all, Skripals would also die, um, and it was uncertain as to whether or not. Um, so no, I think the change, I think also to some extent, I think it's probably is to some extent linked to Syria, where this is not... Not just a chemical, yeah. But the, I mean, yeah. sorry, yeah, yes, chemical to yeah. The fact that yeah. basically the Russians are seen as supporting and undermining mm. the use of biological chemical weapons as an international norm. So I think that, and I think that's why, for example, they did go to the UN and they went, they they actually upped it in terms of investigations, um, because I think most of the international community actually thought, no, you have to put a stop to it. Like this is enough, um, and that was the red line that Obama basically didn't choose to cross. And the Brits, to some extent, did by saying, no, we have to put it up to the agenda. The second question, who would say the second question? Yes. Yeah, for the, uh, why, why Britain, yes? Yeah, I, I mean, because, because this is Britain, although the, 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 there are a lot of uh, former Russian people in Germany, but they, th that's mainly because of the exodus of ethnic Germans from Russia, uh, which began uh, around about the end of the Soviet period. Um, the, the people who've come from Russia most recently, um, the people who are either connected with the regime, having made a lot of money, or are dissidents, opponents of Putin, in some cases both, because they've made the money and then fallen out with Putin, um, and that, that London is their preferred place. Um, and and uh, that's, 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 this is where they come. So Berezovsky, for example, um, decided to make London his headquarters because um, the, it, it's convenient for his, his, him to be able to, to manage the money he's still got, plus the, the English language. Um, now Hodokovsky, Mihal Hodokovsky, um, the, uh, the most prominent now exiled oligarch is still alive, um, managing his political activity precisely from London um, because that's a, a free atmosphere. The, the, Russia, the tradition of Russian emigres working in London goes back to Alexander Herzen, if not before that, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, can, can I take the point about public re report for meddling? Or I guess I just want to yeah. interject that I think yeah. there is something particular about the adversarial relationship between Russian intelligence and British intelligence. I think while the CIA got completely distracted by um, by international terror, um, I think I think the British have have had a sustained and very um, in, intensive uh, focus on Russia. I mean, remember that Putin himself is of the tribe of intelligence, so he may be reading this quite differently from the public at large. But he was there when um, networks of Russian operatives got blown. He spent years mopping up. 
the damage caused by people like Skripal. This is very personal for anyone who's in that tribe. And I think, I think the British are really the most important adversary now. So I, I think in some ways it's a kind of a little bit of a chess game. And that's, that strength of Britain is shown, was shown in a sense in the Russian reception by as soon as uh, Theresa May, without making all the evidence public, but having passed it to, the, to our allies, so many uh, NATO and non-NATO countries backed up uh, Britain and expelled uh, diplomats as well. So the perception in, in Russia is actually quite different. The perception of, of Britain in Russia is quite different from the perception in Britain. Britain's perception is that we're, we're killing ourselves over Brexit, we're losing influence. But in Russia, they say, oh, look, they're, they're mobilizing. They, they still have control. They're, 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 they're a real enemy. And that fits in with, with the James Bond, as Ellen's didn't, you know, Ellen didn't say James Bond, but that's the image of the strength of British intelligence, the man who always wins. Thank you. Um, I might take that last one on so, I was just going to have a two finger on that. But I think, and I mean, but I think there is something, I mean, away from the, 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 the Skripal incident itself, which I think, what, I mean, you, you simply cannot use chemical, bio, biological weapons on people's um, front doors. So, aside, no, I mean, you simply can't. So, aside from that, there is something, however, to be said about the interesting diasporic links that the London has created. And when people talk about the fact that there are a lot of Russians, right, it's not just neutral Russians. Um, and it is something to be taken into account because I think that there is, I mean, I think this is something that the Brits have to consider, which is what happens when the global comes home. Because this isn't simply a case of Russia, right? They are substantial diasporic links where the governments are then repatriated to their homelands to take over the regimes elsewhere too, right? And what is the role that London and Paris play within international security? It is not neutral and it is not simply about Downing Street, right? It is also about those diasporic links. And yes, other countries may not see this as a neutral statement. Now, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, but it is something that London has to be aware of because in some ways waking up and saying, oh, we have all these oligarchs, but, but we think that they're very nice and what happens and why does Putin regime not like them? Well, indeed, but that is the community that some, to some extent the Western governments have created. And that is precisely because in the 1990s and the early 2000s, there was very much an idea that Britain goes global, global does not come home. And something that is changing with the rise of Asia and also with Brexit is, no, the global may come home and then what, then what happens? Um, and it is something that to consider. Precious. Um, yeah, I was just going to uh, talk about that last question. Is public support in Russia for meddling declining and what will the result of sanctions be? Well, you know, most people in Russia really don't believe that the Russian state is responsible for this. So there's quite a lot of public opinion data. They really think that the Brits did it. And that's unsurprising when you look at Russian TV coverage, which is absolutely saturated with very unambiguous message that the, the, that the Brits did it. And masses of evidence for that, you know, the proximity of Port and Down, um, the timing. And, and there's a really clear conspiratorial narrative in the Russian domestic coverage, which I didn't talk about but which is there, which, and which people, even though there have been media trust issues in Russia in the past, particularly around reporting of Ukraine, it's nonetheless still the number one source of information for the vast majority of the population. And so people really don't think that, that Russia did it. Um, result of sanctions, again, we constantly see, you know, Putin's basically a crisis president. He thrives on the ability to appear to manage crises. And so if you look at this with this general perception that you know, the Brits did it anyway, and now they're using this as a political tool to uh, mobilize their Russophobia. That's, a re that's the, the core narrative that Putin has used time and time again to mobilize public support. So it's kind of the opposite of, of what you might think. It, there's not, I, I, think, I think sanctions would not be a domestic problem, really, for Putin, in, in, the, in the short to medium term, at least. I guess to me, I, I'm not sure that Russian meddling is something that is an emotive electoral issue for Russian voters. I think that the number one thing that matters for Putin is the pension reform and anything he can do to change the subject from those kind of pocketbook issues that really get people on the streets, especially evoking an external enemy. It's always good for him domestically. And I would just remember that most of what Putin does, he does because of his internal polling numbers. That's what really motivates him. He watches them like a hawk. <laughs>
next few questions from within the room. So I see one hand down here. Hi, my name is Alexi. I'd just like to thank you all for this wonderful and fascinating talk. Um, just a quick question. Um, so I'm looking at this as a whodunit kind of thing. Like, I'm into, I found the whole thing very fascinating. And this is my own opinion, and I, uh, I'd like love to see what you think about it. So this is my idea on it. Russia was holding the World Cup at this time, and UK, there was a general shitstorm with Brexit, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is who done it and why? I, that's all I want to know. My personal opinion is it wasn't the British intelligence, it wasn't the Russian intelligence, but someone in Russia wanted to use Skripal as a scapegoat, and I just like to think. I just want to ask what you lot think about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second question at the back. The hand. The one. Yeah. Um, hi, my name's Emily. I work in the advancement office at UCL, and Salisbury is my hometown. Um, one of the repercussions that we haven't touched on is the impact on Salisbury, and my interest is how would you comment on both the UK and Russia's seeming disregard for that repercussion on the community of Salisbury and the negative impact it's had? Hi, uh, I'm a student at SEAS, my name is Lavrenti. Um, I just want to ask you, um, if you look at the Russian spending uh, on defense, quite a substantial increase in spending on special forces, riot police, and also the training with the um, uh, training of the um, uh, the one year service national service they've also had the um, training for uh, dealing with the riots um, is that a sign of things to come who wants to take the who done it I think we should all take it <laughs> <laughs> I think we should all take it um, I can give a, a brief response to that um, Exactly, pretty much the, the, the same whole package of words you just used were spoke to me by a, a Russian taxi driver earlier this year who was kind of <laughs> trying, trying to come up with a, a plausible explanation for who might have done it. And again, raising that issue of the World Cup, who would want to derail the World Cup? Does it suit both sides, maybe? Or uh, is it most useful for May to kind of avoid this whole Brexit um, omni shambles? Um, yeah, I'm not going to give you an answer, actually, but I just think it's really interesting that those same kind of issues about timing are coming up and different people come up with absolutely different ideas, and that is where the role of the media is absolutely crucial because playing up specific elements of that and which parts of the chronology are most important really influence how you perceive what the motives behind it were, why the timing was politically relevant, and then who you ultimately would, would think is responsible. So, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to pass a judgment on it. I'll wait for more evidence. Who wants to take the question about? Yeah. Uh, Salisbury. I have to tell you, I am completely with you on this. the The fact that a chemical, a military grade chemical weapon, was used on a civilian community, and the whole country wasn't <coughs> up in arms about the public health risk to that, that it was not the number one story. Most days, it was the number five story after three Brexit stories. Um, I. I was gobsmacked by that, that it wasn't being dealt with on a na national level as a public health issue. There were, that city, whole chunks of that city were disappearing in some cases behind cordons and streets and communities and people's homes were suddenly uh, behind massive, you, you saw it, sort of massive tents and barricades. Um, this was a real risk to ordinary people, and I feel like there wasn't enough um, concern about that. Um, but I think part of it was the kind of spirit of getting through it, and people in Salisbury also were really <coughs> concerned about the economy, and they wanted to keep the story a little bit quieter so that footfall on the high street didn't suffer. Um, and, and I think there was a really strong message from the community not to overblow the risks. 
um, on the on the final question um, on the Russian defence spending, um, it certainly uh -huh. is significant that um, uh, was it three years ago now perhaps that the Roskvadia, the Russian National Guard, was established um, specifically with the rights to uh, fire into uh, pro civilian protesting civilians. Um, that clearly reflected the fear of protest, which has been um, worrying Putin ever since the 2011-2012 electoral cycle, the protests against the a fraud in the state Duma elections. Um, Zoloshev had previously been uh, somebody very, very close to Putin as practically his bodyguard. And also the function is to stop, protect Putin against internal coups within the Kremlin against himself, which is another threat uh, to Putin. And um, uh, as Ellen says quite rightly, Putin watches his ratings carefully. The point is that over the last uh, few months, they really have fallen um, as uh, living standards have been attacked, despite the price of oil going up when this hasn't fed through this time to, to ordinary Russians. Just on Alex's question, I mean, I think it's, it says absolutely clear who, who did it. Uh, British intelligence identified the people. Um, the, two, the two men who then, as in the uh, interview that um, uh, Precious uh, analyzed, um, who, who then, sorry? Why, why, because they, well, because for the relations connected with the election, and that uh, this was something that Putin could show the, the power that Russia had on a world scale, and he could also show uh, to anyone who's thinking of defecting, or anyone who might have been thinking about any other sort of political opposition, that this will lead to your death. So it's, <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Next three questions. Okay, I see a uh, hand right at the back, uh, the man with glasses. Good evening, my name is Julian. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, on the question of meddling, so you, you tantalise us a bit there, you said um, on the Russian side the, the narrative seems to be that the West did meddle in the early 2000s and therefore everything that's since stemmed from that is a response. Um, was there any meddling? Can you hand the microphone to the woman just in front of you, please? Um, hello, I'm Eleanor Pierce from the University of Aberdeen. Um, I have a question for Precious specifically. Um, um, thank you so much for all of your talks. Um, they're very interesting. But I'm just, I just find it so hard to understand why RT could have made the mistake of publishing this interview that was so laughable. Um, it being obviously a very sort of sophisticated sort of communications operation. So I just, I wonder whether you've had a chance to think about that at all. Was there a question over here? Hi, uh, Howard, I'm a, a Mason in the Seas. Um, I suppose it's a question for Ellen. Uh, what you were saying about, you thought the British authorities had lost control of the narrative a bit um, by being secretive. Um, and I wanted to ask about um, an interview with Skripal himself because um, obviously that's a big uh, sort of talking point for the the Russian side that he's disappeared and is he dead? Where is he? We don't know what, it, what what's happened to him. Um, do you think British intelligence will ever allow an interview with Skripal? And what do they say when reporters try to get and ask about that? Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Should we go in order? So Glara meddling. Yeah. So in terms of meddling, um, so I think was there any meddling? I mean, I, look, I think I would say that there was a, an assumption in the 1990s that there basically wasn't an, the end of history and that the West way of life had won over and that was basically how the world was going to keep on running. And in that context, the West did put on quite a uh, forward-looking agenda to other parts of the world with a particular view on how the world should be running. And within that context, if one has a different point of view, I think that it may have been perceived as meddling. Yes, because I think allying the West did sponsor groups within Russia that the Putin regime thought would undermine the political order. Now, whether one agrees or disagrees with such sponsoring operations and whether one thinks they are on the side of good or bad is up for debate. But from the point of view of the domestic regime, there was an element of, yes, the West basically funding a lot of NGOs. 
linking up with a lot of oligarchs, with allowing a lot of the oligarchs of the West liked to be able to move to London, get a British citizenship, and live very nicely, thank you very much. You know, whether or not that was good or bad, whether the West should have done it or not, I think that world has to some extent changed. I think there is a realization very much that um, nowadays that the power of the West to influence elsewhere is one, not, uh, not total, and two, that perhaps it's not always positive. But arguably in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was not what the world we were living in. I would also just note that a lot of these, a lot of these kind of N NGOs or external programs, for example, had to do with documenting uh, victims of Stalinist purges or, or trying to do journalism in the Caucasus where there's a huge amount of killing of civilians by security services, um, and that this all was seeded in the 1990s when you had a country that was in economic collapse and subject to, I mean, and, and when Western money, external money was coming in in vast amounts and there was a sense of great openness, which changed over time, the perception of it changed to being external meddling from being aid. And I was there when these people started to get kicked out. It happened really quickly. All, all I can say is in 1994, they didn't see it as meddling. It was seen as aid, right? And obviously, it turned into something that Putin um, regarded as undermining his power. I think there are different, there are so many different mm -hmm. kinds of meddling slash aid intervention that we're talking about. So the Orange Revolution in Ukraine absolutely did get Western support, but the White Ribbon demonstrations, which I was present for, really were not a Western project. So, but I think Putin came to see all of this as a CIA-backed project. But I think that's what's important to keep in mind, is in the same way as Putin came to see everything that had any, like that was going on, both in the region and domestically, as basically being set up from the West. I think there is a danger that, to some extent, we over perceive the level of meddling and the level of Russia's capability, or perhaps even intent, in meddling in the West in the, in the 2010s. Like, we also have to kind of keep it in perspective. Precious. That's actually a really good point for me to jump off from. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, you asked, you know, how did RT make this abysmal mistake, given that it's such a sophisticated operation, and therein lies the crux of the answer. Um, you know, the wider context for us is this discussion of information warfare, hybrid warfare, etc. Everyone's really concerned about RT as an element of that, and it's been, uh, it's benefited, basically, from kind of positive publicity in the light of this overwhelming fear about Russian intervention. RT, by all accounts, is not that sophisticated an operation. The left hand often doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, they have far fewer sort of um, clear editorial guidelines than, you know, say, the BBC does. They're a very new network. They haven't got those kind of practices and procedures institutionalized, and a lot of things seems to be ad hoc. And I know personally, if I was a journalist at RT, I can imagine being horrified that this that this interview went out, um, I can imagine journalists there probably weren't too happy about that because then they have got to somehow maintain some sort of professional credibility in the light of this uh, performance, uh, shall we say. So I think it was massively misjudged, but I don't think that that should surprise us so much. I think RT has always traded on its ability to neutralize any kind of genuine criticism with satire. So, so, for instance, when it's called Propaganda Outlet, it will gleefully um, publicize that on its own adverts um, as if it somehow proves that it's telling you things that they up there don't want you to know about. And so I really don't think it imagined that this would backfire. I don't think the leadership of the network thought this would backfire as badly as it did. On the question of, of, of Skripal and whether we'll see him, I, I would guess not. I mean, there's so many questions about how he can live now. Can he ever see his mother or speak to his mother again? Can he ever walk on the street? 
again? Where can he live that's safe? And I think those questions were already burdensome, you know, for many years before this happened. And now I'm sure for him, and but most painfully for his daughter, are um, crushing questions. I doubt that they will want to agitate the Russian side by putting him out there. We also don't know how he is. Remember, Nick Bailey also has not spoken publicly. What they went through, we don't quite understand. You heard how Yulia described it. She said, it, she described it as an ordeal that, um, that was sort of emotionally uh, overwhelming. And um, I, I, think, I think being poisoned by this kind of substance, we don't really know what it does to you. Um, I'm Marius, I'm studying at CIS. Um, quite recently, uh, Putin has said that um, Skripal was a traitor and uh, that he should be treated as such. Uh, would you see that as a kind of a shift in strategy that the Kremlin has seen, okay, we have um, made a mistake concerning how we covered the, the story until now, so especially with regard to the RT um, interview, and then now they just try to yeah, apply a different strategy, saying, he, uh, well, he's a traitor and he deserves what happened to him. I was just wondering, given that Putin largely campaigns on a platform of domestic issues, and that in Russian domestic media, the conspiratorial narrative is widely believed, how much do you think it actually matters to him and to his government that RT has lost so much credibility? Thank you. Uh, I'm Nigel. I'm from CIS as well, uh, a student. Um, I wanted to ask another question about competence. Uh, obviously, very long-running uh, uh, Soviet and Russian uh, secret service, but how is it that apparently it was such an incompetent operation in the first place? Obviously, the the tourist story, the travel methods, but they didn't care about CCTV, they didn't uh, use any disguise at all. I mean, is, the, is that because that's just a show, or they don't care, or is it, you know, even, you know, did they expect to be unmasked? It seems unlikely, but... Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, in recent years in general, um, you can see that particular um, officially uh, supported narratives uh, as put forward by you know, members of the government, including Putin and also on the media, they change with uh, great frequency and it's quite a strategic use base, basically aimed at essentially regime legitimation under changing circumstances. So I think absolutely there's, there's definitely an element of this in trying to basically cover all bases. It's a sort of scramble in how you then present this case as it keeps evolving and it's 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 constantly a game of, of catch up to public opinion, to understandings of it. Uh, and ultimately for a, for a domestic audience, um, Stripal was a traitor and so what does it matter anyway? And besides, you know, the UK did it. So, so it's quite, I think from that perspective that, that makes a lot of sense um, for Putin to kind of change his tune that way. Um, and maybe if I just yeah. go into the question about um, domestic media, does it matter to Putin that RT has lost its credibility? Well, there's a real risk that because of the fallout of this, RT ends up losing any of its kind of soft power capacity. And you've got to remember that RT is not just a, a kind of one clear machine, right? It's a really complex, disorganized organization that does lots of things at once. And this, so, so one of the things they're really invested in at the moment is um, online social media educational projects. They're really pushing that. They're very high quality. They're taking it to kind of international um, showcases and getting a lot of recognition for it. And there's a danger that this absolute omni shambles of an interview reflects again so badly on that more positive message that they're trying to do of actually quality things and takes the narrative right back to, well, art is just propaganda anyway, which the network itself is trying really hard to get away from, and which could be of benefit more broadly to the Russian state. So, so there's that. And then secondly, well, does it matter to Putin? I think on that basis, 
you know, in a sort of more removed fashion. It does, but does it matter to the network? You know, Putin is not synonymous with RT. RT is not just the empty vessel for Putin's uh, vision of the world. You know, it has its own institutional identity. The journalists who work there have their own opinions, and they do have journalistic agency, actually. So it's much, can, it's much more than that, and the fallout from this terrible interview is actually much more significant because of that, because of the complexity of, of that picture, I think. On the incompetence question, or do you have an answer, Pete? No, I have to. Okay, on the incompetence question, um, I think that it's an interesting one. Um, but what we have seen in the last few months is just generally a pattern of kind of carelessness um, that's happening on a large scale. So Bellingcat found, what, 350 GRU officers who had registered their cars to the off office of the GRU, presumably because it would help them avoid parking tickets or something, I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, but the fact that that, was, that that was available in sort of open source suggests that they're, um, you know, like, like a lot of big Russian bureaucracies, that they may not be crossing um, all their T's and dotting their I's. One um, former, uh, I think, uh, KGB, FSB um, person that we were talking to about this, uh, we were asking about why, why, would they, why would they take the train, why not just rent a, rent a car or something less, um, uh, that would expose them less, and he said, well, you know, I, I have a feeling I know what it was. They had an expense account that was mm. set, <laughs> and they thought they could save some of the money, and then buy stuff for themselves that was that was his that was his reading of it but obviously it is an embarrassment i mean they were captured what like 16 times clear images of their face it's terrible it's terrible i mean it's terrible work and putin's going to be upset about it because he knows what good work is but i th i think um but I think something that is, and I suspect the takeaway message to Western governments, uh, will also be the extent to which basically what it is that you can find online and how, I mean, this is a favorite, used to be a favorite um, issue in the UK, right? How much CCTV you actually have. And I think it's interesting to put it in the context of Turkey, for example, because it's not to some extent just the Russians who got caught out. Uh, and then you have this bigger debate when it comes to, let's say, cyber and sort of all this media all this film and what what happens to it and who has the power to control it and access it and who doesn't right because in the case of turkey they released the images a lot of the time in this case it was civil society what it you know and i think it's a wake-up call to a lot of intelligence operatives because i guess the assumption is that they are all captured on cctv the question is whether or not those operations and those tapes get released one and two, who releases them? Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's just not, that's not just going to be a question for the Russians. I think it's going to be a question for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I'm, uh, I think for in, the, in defense of Vladimir Putin, um, I, I think he has been. To raise the how Putin? I think he has been consistent. I mean, he said in 2010 that uh, all, they were all traitors, and, and now he's saying it again. And I, I, I would stick to this position yeah. that, uh, that <coughs> Russian people do get the message, not all Russian people, but I don't believe the opinion polls when, uh, that when Russians say that they, and I believe it, I believe what the opinion polls report, but why the Russians say that the British did it, it's because they're in, living in an authoritarian society, they don't know who they're talking to or who the ans answers are going to be referred back to. So a lot of them, not everyone by any means, but a lot of people say what they think they're supposed to say, which is that uh, whether they're talking to foreign um, uh, to company, uh, foreign based opinion polls or to, uh, to Russian ones. They, they say what they think the regime wants them to say. Um, on, the, on this interview, um, I, I try to get the dynamics of it because it's worried me for a while. I mean, there is a, ser there is a theory um, that the aim was to punish those agents, the aim was to humiliate them on television. Um, but they, the GU, as, uh, as uh, Ben right, quite rightly called it, had, had, had failed badly and demonstrated their incompetence. Um, and now they should be dragged through the coals. I'm afraid I don't believe that because I don't think it's in Putin's interest to discredit his own intelligence services. It's, it's just, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the way that he as a former KGB person um, would, would ever uh, operate. Rather, I think the, the what ha I think happened, I'm guessing partly, the RT was instructed by the Kremlin that they had to interview 
these agents. And this is the bit that I'm not really sure about, and you may laugh at it, but I think that Margarita Simonian actually decided, ah, I don't, why should I do this? Um, and I'm going to demonstrate some journalistic independence for once. And I'm going to uh, sort of put these people on the spot. And, uh, and when they start talking about um, how they, they didn't like the snow and they're actually from Siberia, um, that then I'm going to sort of express some incredulity, to use the word that uh, Precious used. And so, and, and that this, the reason for that was that she wanted to demonstrate the independence of RT. What is significant, I think, is that, as far as I know, she hasn't been, uh, not only not shot, she hasn't been sacked from her position at the head of RT, um, which means that there's, there is still a debate in, inside the, the regime as to what was the best tactic for it. But, but um, certainly... What was clear, what would back up what I'm saying, is that the agents themselves, when they, were, they, they began to object live on the television, or maybe it was recorded, I'm not sure, but they objected on, in the interview, I thought you were going to, we thought you were going to support us. Why are you doing this to us? Which is, leaves me to think that this uh, really was, was Margarita Semenyan, as I say, the, the top head of RT, um, going on her own initiative. Because such initiatives are actually possible inside Russia today. There is not everyone in Russia is, corrupt, is, corrupt, is as corrupt as, as everyone else. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. The final three questions. Okay, uh, so there's somebody right at the back. Please, Chloe, first. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Will. I'm an economics student here at UCL. I have a question probably specifically for Pete Duncan. Oh. So you mentioned that some of the reasons uh, for the murder would be to act as a deterrent or further political uh, distance, mm -hmm. or just the current ones, and just to win popularity in elections for Putin. Mm. So I guess my question would be, as, uh, so how is this any different from the murder of Litvinenko um, some time ago in terms of a deterrent, and in terms of winning an election, if Kremlin explicitly rejects any claims or any allegations that they did um, murder Skripal, how is this gonna help Putin or helped Putin mm -hmm. in elections. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sasha. Hi, I just wanted to, to probably clarify that making sense of something that does make sense probably <laughs> is not a very good idea. So A, uh, if we'll remember Kim Philby, I don't think anybody regards him as a hero in this audience, definitely. So he is an enemy of Britain, right? So therefore, uh, exactly. He is a traitor. So Skripal is a traitor. Let, let's face it. So that makes sense. But then what happens afterwards doesn't make sense. So what doesn't make sense, what we're trying to make sense of it, right? We can't make sense of complete incompetence of Britain not replying to any events properly. Can we please explain to the whole Russian audience and to the Brits sitting here why, till now, whilst we've seen the images of Litvinenko, on his dying bed, and we have never seen Skripal. Why is it that we don't know where they are? Why is it that the government is not even in, in, remotely interested in counteracting propaganda by, sorry, by Russia today? So that, that's what we're trying to make sense, but I don't think it would make sense. All the mistakes being done there are not explained because they are mistakes, right? So maybe we should allow for mistakes being done by the to whatever are their names, different names, right, by the officers who were trying to commit this uh, offense, or by the counterintelligence in Britain, who should have provided security for Skripal in the first place, knowing that he was a traitor. So the question is how to the panelists where you can say, can we prevent something like that in the future, given the um, lessons of Litvinenko and Skripal? Thank you. The final question. Hi, Alex. I'm a student at CIS. Um, I was wondering what the what the whole event says about the the coordination or the lack of between different arms of uh, the Russian intelligence services, particularly the uh, the GU and the FSB. And have you put any credence into this idea of a sort of an institutional vendetta? to me, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So, my, my, sorry, thank you. Um, so, thank you very much for your question. Um, the, 
the, there's a, the, I think there's quite a substantial qualitative difference between uh, Litvinenko's murder and the poisoning of the Skripals in that I don't think that uh, Putin and, and the FSB wanted to be found out. Um, they, this, this was a very different political situation in 2006 than it was in 2018 after Ukraine, after Syria. Um, the, they wanted, the, the, what they wanted to do, the, the main thing they wanted to do was just to shut Yitvinenko up because he was coming out with all sorts of allegations, particularly about the uh, bombings of the blocks of flats in 1999, which were, may have been conducted, which he said, and I think he's probably training, it's probably right, were conducted by the FSB in order to help Putin to come to power. And so uh, the poison was used um, polonium 210, which would take a long time to, for it to work. It was nearly three weeks between the time the poison was administered and the time that he actually died. Before that, it, it seemed like some kind of um, uh, food poisoning. And it was basically almost, it was an accident practically. It was only on the very last day he died that the, uh, the scientists found out exactly what it was. They thought it was something else, I forgot what, what, what it was now, that, 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 that helped it to be linked um, to, to the Russian state. There was a very strong chance it would never have been linked uh, to Russia. Um, the, how Putin, how this helps Putin, the, the, the killing of uh, Skripals, um, I'm, I was trying to argue that, um, that it's shown right from the start, it was shown on television um, that uh, this, had, this had happened that day um, that, and in the context of Putin wanting to demonstrate Russia's power. It's absolutely true, Ellen's absolutely right. The main thing that affects people, uh, people's views of Putin are what's happening domestically. But what, what, what opinion polls have shown, for whatever they're worth, fairly consistently, is the area that Putin, inside Russia, is seen as having been most successful in is foreign policy. And foreign policy was beginning to look a bit, a bit ropey in some ways uh, in relation to Ukraine and Syria, where the deaths had begun to happen. And there were, had been fears in Russia of uh, Russia getting sucked into, into Ukraine. But in any case, the main point was this was a demonstration of Russia's power internationally. And um, I was trying to argue that uh, these denials are not meant to be believed. Thank you. So we have three minutes left to respond. Yeah. So on the on the kind of coordination or lack thereof, that's a it's a really good question. Historically, it's it's absolutely a fact. Like the CIA and the FBI, the GRU and and the KGB were absolutely rivals, and Putin was for sure on one team against the other. They, I mean, you. you so the KGB actually has its own foreign intelligence service, and one of the jobs that they do is to surveil the GRU foreign intelligence. So. So it's, they were actually doing parallel tasks many times um, in competition, and they are competitors. They were always competitors. What's happening now is even more complicated because you have this proliferation of different kinds of operative groups. So you have a privatization of military intelligence, the Wagner type groups that are doing the same job. And I think coordination is not perfect. You've seen it in Syria, where the American military and the Russian military were communicating about, um, about the presence of an operational group, which turned out to be one of the privatized Russian groups. Um, but that somehow got lost in the official conversation. So I think that's gonna continue to be much more complicated, not necessarily because they're hiding it, but because there is now a proliferation of different actors. I think, I mean, I think in terms of the, in terms of the, um, I mean, I think that in terms of preventing the attack, no, there is nothing that the UK can do if the Russians want to kill someone. Like, come on, like, realistically, if, if a state wants to kill another, it's so, well, somebody else in a different state, yes, of course they can do it. And as Pete has mentioned, they have done that repeatedly. The difference this time is that basically the Brits couldn't hide the fact that the Russians had done that and it was a more public use of chemical weaponry. Um, the Russians have been, for, uh, certain Russians have been uh, dying like flies recently. Um, the, arguably, if the Russian state wants to continue, then 
doing so, that they will continue doing so. Um, what would be interesting was whether or not the Brits will start publicising their deaths and whether the coroner reports mm. will be changed and whether or not proper investigations mm. will be done. Mm. I would say they, they're not going to, but that's a personal take on it because I think it will be an embarrassment to the Brits. On that note, thank you very much for those very interesting <laughs> questions. <laughs> I would have thrown something about Brexit. Um, I was going to, but then I would have to finish. Thank you very much to the panellists. Good night. Thank you. Well they started applauding before I was getting ready. Good night. Tune in next week when we'll discuss.